Hello, I'm Eric Strong, a hospitalist and faculty at Stanford University. In this installment of Strong Medicine's Intern Crash Course, I'll be discussing an approach to rapid response calls, which are known by a variety of names in hospitals, but which all share the goal of bringing more help to the bedside quickly for an inpatient who has experienced an abrupt decline in their condition. In the hospital, in addition to routine daily rounds, there are a variety of unplanned moments of patient care which have widely varying degrees of urgency to which clinicians need to know how to respond. On one end of the spectrum are pages from the bedside nurse for non-urgent PRN meds, like a laxative for constipation. On the other are code blues for cardiac or respiratory arrests. Anything that an intern or resident could get called about regarding a direct need for a patient falls in between these extremes. A missing diet order is on the low end of acuity, a need for electrolyte repletion and additional pain medication somewhere in the middle, decreased urine output a little higher, and getting close to the code blue are situations like declining consciousness, new onset chest pain, hypotension, and acute respiratory distress. While each hospital has specific criteria for initiating a rapid response call, most commonly, the bedside nurse will trigger it for one of these problems here. In response to the formal call, most typically an ICU nurse, an ICU fellow or resident, and a respiratory therapist come to the bedside within a few minutes. Hopefully, though not always, someone from the patient's primary team has also been alerted. There may be more people than this who initially run over, particularly during daylight hours. There is also a gray zone with changes in clinical status in which concern might be warranted, but the change from baseline is not quite to the degree where the nurse feels a formal rapid response call is indicated or has occurred a little bit more slowly. For example, a systolic pressure that drops from 100 to 85, or an O2 requirement that increases from 3 liters to 6, or patient whose urine output has been steadily declining, not over the span of one hour, but over the span of eight hours or 12 hours. In these situations, the nurse might start with a call to the intern or resident asking for them to come to the bedside ASAP. If you're responding to that type of ASAP call, you may find yourself and the nurse the only ones at the bedside, or depending on circumstances, there may be a random assortment of healthcare workers like an informal ad hoc response team. The principles I'm going to discuss here will be equally applicable to both scenarios, when you are the primary person responding to an urgent page, when it's only you and one or two other people, and when you are just one member of a much larger formal team. The rest of the video will cover three things. How these types of urgent clinical scenarios differ from the routine ones which, uh, with which you're more familiar, how to manage resources and the team at the bedside, what's known as crisis resource management, and common pitfalls. And this whole discussion will serve as a lead-in to a collection of videos within the Intern Crash Course series that will cover specific urgent inpatient scenarios like acute respiratory distress, hypotension, and new onset chest pain. So how does responding to an urgent inpatient call differ from routine calls and bedside encounters. There are two major differences. First, the differential diagnosis for the patient's clinical decline is usually relatively short because it has to be something that develops very quickly and is almost always something that patients are at risk from due to either their hospitalization or due to acute illness in general. So for example, while something like a COPD exacerbation or a pleural effusion may be common reasons for patients to come into the ER with shortness of, of, of breath. These are not usually going to be the culprit behind an urgent inpatient call for respiratory distress. Unless, and this is a huge caveat, the ex explanation for the decline is a worsening of the patient's presenting problem, which should always be the first consideration. So if a patient was admitted because of a COPD exacerbation, in that case, a worsening of the exacerbation could easily explain declining respiratory status. But if they were admitted for a heart failure exacerbation or for an arrhythmia, it's probably not going to be COPD. The second difference between urgent and routine encounters 
is that you as the clinician must gather data, assess the data, and initiate treatment all at the same time, or at least overlapping, resulting in a relatively high degree of uncertainty. Typically, in most medical fields, uh, when a patient reports a symptom, for example, when they come into uh, the clinic, for example, or you're called to admit the patient from the ER and on the inpatient team, you know, you can take a history and conduct a physical exam, then think a little bit about the differential diagnosis, maybe do an additional exam maneuver or order some tests, then think some more about the differential, and then eventually you can go ahead and order treatment. But with urgent and rapid response calls, you don't have the luxury of time. The patient has been getting worse too quickly to necessarily wait for uh, all the relevant data before making decisions. While this is a routine for our colleagues in emergency medicine and in the ICU, on the medical and surgical wards, it may feel less familiar and less comfortable. This does not necessarily mean that you must actively do something different in response to an urgent call. Sometimes in change in vitals is just part of the normal minute-to-minute -minute variability a person can experience. Sometimes the patient has a really abnormal baseline of which a nurse just coming on shift might just not be aware of. And sometimes more aggressive treatment isn't consistent with the patient's goals of care. But even in situations in which new treatment is not initiated, you are still making that decision to not initiate treatment before you have as much data as you typically would for a new admission or a new consult. Next, how do we manage the room, the team, and the resources during an urgent or rapid response call. The first thing, if there are more than two people present, establish who is the leader. If it's a small group, just a resident nurse and nursing assistant, it may be obvious it's the resident. But there, if, if there is more than one physician present, such as the primary resident and a hospitalist, or two interns from the primary team and an ICU resident, the leader may not be clear. And even if it's obvious to you, don't assume it's obvious to everyone in the room. The more people who are present, the less likely everyone will already know everyone else there and their roles, and thus the more important it is to verbally state aloud who is going to be the leader. The leader should also take a moment to learn the role of everyone else present. Determine why precisely the call was made. For example, the bedside nurse could provide a 30 to 60 second report via an SBAR format. By now, you hopefully have some idea of who is there already and what might still be needed. The patient is unarousable or has respiratory distress. Let's make sure RT is on their way. The patient has chest pain. Make sure someone is bringing over the ECG machine. Remember that it will typically take the radiology technologist the longest to get there, so as soon as you think a chest x-ray might be needed, make sure someone is paging them. You'll obviously need to perform a very focused history and exam based on the primary problem. I'll be covering the details of what specifically should be included here in the separate videos for each of the common reasons and scenarios for such calls. When the leader starts giving directions, the team should practice closed loop communication. That means that when something is requested, the receiver of the request repeats it back and then later confirms to the leader that it was done. If the leader is unsure of what to do next, it is absolutely fine to ask for suggestions from the rest of the team. It's not uncommon for someone other than the official leader to actually have more experience in these situations and who can offer some guidance. That's particularly true of RT and issues with ventilation and airway. At some point, you need to make a decision as to whether the patient is stable enough to remain where they're located in the hospital or if they need to move to a higher acuity area, such as the ICU. When making that decision, include the perspective of the bedside nurse and of the unit's charge nurse. If the nurses are telling you that they feel uncomfortable with the patient remaining where they are, I would place a lot of weight on that. You know, once everyone else has walked away, the bedside nurse is the one who's going to be left caring for the patient. If that nurse is feeling uneasy about that and are telling you that they feel uneasy about that, you should feel uneasy about it too. And as soon as the opportunity is available, someone should notify both the family and the patient's primary attending of the change in status if they are not present at the time. As a hospitalist, 
there are honestly few things that are more frustrating um, in the hospital than finding out many hours after the fact that your patient had a rapid response call and was transferred to the ICU. You know, calling the attending should not be the top priority for an unstable patient, but it only takes a few minutes to ask a nursing assistant or ward clerk to page them to come over. After the dust has settled and the patient has been stabilized either in their room or has been sent to the ICU, find some time to debrief about the event with either other physicians who are present or even someone who wasn't. You know, ask yourself what went well and discuss what you would have done differently if you could do it again. The last thing to discuss are the common pitfalls when responding to rapid response calls. No clear team leader in a crowded room, leading to chaos. The leader is doing too much multitasking. For example, giving orders for meds and fluids while simultaneously ultrasounding the patient's lungs. Or spending three minutes with an ECG and a set of calipers while a room full of people are waiting for instructions. If the leader is multitasking, they are either not delegating tasks appropriately, or there's not enough help in the room. Poor prioritization. This can happen with tests. For example, if the call was about acute chest pain, do not delay an ECG in order to first draw labs. It can also happen with treatments. For example, mistakenly focusing on giving antibiotics to a hypotensive septic patient rather than first worrying about their hemodynamics. Delaying and upgrading of the situation. For example, if the original call was just an urgent come to the bedside page to the intern, but the intern immediately feels out of their depth, they should request a rapid response call. And during a rapid response call, if the patient suddenly loses their pulse or requires intubation because they've stopped breathing, call a code blue. Even if the room already feels crowded and sufficiently staffed, the upgrade of the call can trigger resources that you didn't even realize weren't there. For example, a code blue might bring an anesthesiologist and an x-ray tech who otherwise wouldn't have come. This leads into the most important pitfall of all, failing to ask for help. You are never alone in the hospital. If you find yourself in an urgent situation with an unstable patient in front of you and you don't know what to do next, either because you're one month into your internship or because the patient is unusually complex or is not responding to your initial interventions, there is always someone else in the building who can offer assistance. A resident, an ICU fellow, an ICU attending, a hospitalist, an anesthesiologist, a critical care nurse, an RT, an RT supervisor, whoever you need, find someone to have that person paged. In 20 years, I have never encountered a medical professional who was upset over being paged for an urgent situation in which their help was specifically requested. That's it for this overview on responding to rapid response calls and other urgent inpatient issues. Check out more videos in this series to learn about the approach to specific urgent problems.